Brian is a writer. He has an alter ego named Brian with an I as opposed to a Y like in James Brian. His alter ego is very busy working full time at IU, freelancing with his media company, No Guru Media, as well as practicing massage therapy, teaching Qigong, hanging out with his girlfriend and three cats and his motley crew of friends, but enough about that I, Brian. James Bryan has been writing since he was a young boy. His passion for poetry came after an eighth grade literature project in which his Ode to an Orange, a highly suggestive piece of euphemism erotica, was made to be read aloud to the principal and later to other faculty. While attending Indiana University, James recorded many poems along the margins of classroom notebooks and has published over 50 poems from these and other works on the social platform Instagram. He doesn't know what else to do with them. He wonders, what do people, do people read new poetry in books? This body of work has been entitled Arrogant Enlightenment and a Cry for Purpose. James is currently working on a series of poems simply called Purpose. He will be sharing from this collection, as well as from a recently self-published memoir entitled Wahoo, a tale recounting one summer aboard a commercial fishing vessel uh, long lining for a halibut in the Bering Sea. Okay, James. Well, it's nice to see familiar faces. And actually, I know you from Kelly, right? Yeah. Yeah, IIB. Yeah. Cool. Well, there we go. It's a new face in the poetry uh, on demand. Okay, so today I'm just going to share a variety of different things. I intended to have a little bit of a structured plan to how they were going to be read, but um, as time will have it, uh, I did not do that, so um, we'll just do it in an abstract order. Okay. All right, so this one has no title. Um, and for those who are already part of the Writers Guild, it's going to be redundant. Some of it, you guys have already heard it, but some people haven't. So um, this one says, time offers no allowance to the past. Predisp predisposed progress propels forward, and our memories drift marooned on a self-curated island of horror and exceptional elation estates, and first-time dates and boxes of photo albums labeled just a little too late. And when faced with the what is really reality debate, it's splashed on a canvas of thoughts in between the actuality of the memory and the rest just a dream that we tell to keep talking and telling our tale to others whose canvas may be as big as a whale. And whoever can know but the eternity ledger who cares not for our fleeting, repeating endeavors of this energy cycle kept here in this round again and again, woo woo, space dust in a frown. Where is the crystal clear island of truth for the past? somewhere drowning in time's ocean, made of nothing can last. This one's called, That's a Roll. Set has the path been bent by mind's maker. Tensel time, think your thoughts, the toll taker. Imminent import, a past not to ponder, as forming a future from freedom feels fonder. And as for that destiny sick on a cycle, I'll give it a tissue and finger the Eiffel. Feel your heart hustle, feel your mind control, else be a turn on a ball that's a roll. Rolling and rolling and chatting the altitude breathers, thin air and cloud hair and straight white teeth of the breeders. It's all happening right underneath us. Tap into the ground and tell eyes how to see thus, that there be a key in the beats of a soul and it's balancing awareness on a ball that's a roll. And this is a very short one. Once upon a tethered blid, the hearts of loveless tear that shed a gulf between those tied the end with hopes of truth I must suspend. For what keeps hold has arrived somewhere, the space and time and subtle air that ebbs the lungs and flows the thoughts to please their threads forget-me-nots. Thoughts keep docked and saved at shore. But I can't wait there anymore. Mm. So this one is 
uh, a response to working in an office space with a bunch of technology. Um, occasionally, there's like an opportunity when no one's in the office space for me to do like kind of like energy work and like feel into the space a little bit more. And all that does is make it really obvious how much like the technology surrounding us like is actually like physically affecting us too. So it inspired a poem, the feeling basically of, of the technology, just called Buzz. There is a buzz in the air, an almost metallic sounding, tangy tasting, pressure feeling fuzz that floats on the fans of the CPUs that remain unceasing thanks to a stream of green that feeds the great excavating and burning of organic material waste. The mass of LED, LCD, USB, XQD, HDMI, XLR, quarter inch, scratch discs, fiber runs, ethernet numbs the senses by surrounding one with interference. The intersection between man and technology. Neither knows no apology like classification, so call them taxonomy and tax on the rich. Say we'll fix the economy side of me. I sit with myself, the bane of my own biology, and try to see some greater soul that's inside of me. But inevitably, wake up wired, weary, wanting inexorably to break all the screens and shred all the wires and quiet the buzz from the waves stuck inside us. It's gotten too loud, the invisible crowd drowning introspe introspection in high frequency buzz. Um, I don't know if anybody works with a lot of technology. I mean, this guy, this guy does here. Um, but like, if you're around it all the time, it's palpable. You can, it doesn't feel nice all the time. Um, okay, so we'll just keep on, keep on rolling here. Um, this one I really wanted to rework for this um, because I wanted to elaborate on a couple things, but again, as time allowed, that's not, that's not going to happen yet, so I will just read what we have. It's called Antebellum America Awaits. Here we are, back to the one-way conversation page. Oh, how this audience here seems hard to see when it's just the words and spaces on a piece of paper, it says on screen, but now it's been put on paper. And then I meta meta back pedal on my way to a more purposeful dialogue, a constructive dialogue, the observation and dismemberment of the greater society around me. And looking both ways, so opposite, cross-eyed, bug-eyed, pug-eyed, dear heroes of whoever your people approve of. Fingers are gavels and judgment are shovels. Our voices have reverb, reverb, reverb. Hollow face tuning technology ingests us. That's a theme, I guess. I'm weak with it. Your antebellum America awaits. I'm sure that I'm not happy about where everything seems to be headed. Even the passion pain that aches from the unfathomable and ethereal quality of life as we attempt to know it can't quell the swell and sway of the different opinions of each in a day. Opinions ostracize. The birds in my neck of the woods are obsessed with my bird feeder. And my cat loves the birds. My plants along the windowsill sit somewhat precarious positioned near the elation station where Toulouse, my cat, devises and executes his plan to overcome the window. My plants would hate my cat if they understood the concept that he's a threat. I always put them back where they were after he's knocked them over, spilling some soil and breaking their branches. They don't complain. Can't you see the entire universal cycle in this silly scenario? We as people, to elaborate, because I didn't write this, but would have liked to. We as people have desires. Those desires that we actually have are typically fairly unattainable. So we attempt, you have this, you know, you can see them, but you can't get to them. And your actions to try to get to something result in, you know, some type of negative action. So your attempt to control create a problem. That problem is fixed, and you continue still to do those same things. So it's kind of, you know, addressing that cycle. Um, so continuing from from where that is. I love you. I'm working on my delivery on this. I love you. 
I hope that I can believe in what I'm saying. I love you. It's better when there's more eyes to get responses from, too, you know. But I do. I mean, I, what else is there to, to do but try to love, you know, those who are at least willing, you know, to, to be present with you. But, you know, do you approach people with love in your heart, or are you so tired that the culturally ritualized hate pervades your best intentions precept? So even if, you, you know, you really maybe want to do that is, I mean, sometimes it does feel like overwhelming to try to stay in such a love mindset with so much negativity in the world, you know? Um, but where are we? So when I was doing this, I just began selecting um, whatever my phone was feeding me, just out of curiosity to uh, possibly what the AI was going to decide for the poem. So I just put, where are we? and then let the phone do the rest. Going to dinner tonight for tomorrow morning at the same time to meet you at around seven or tomorrow morning if that works for you or if I can come over early, I will have the energy to get you moolah when we get back home and get the social media move to there for the weekend plans uh, to be done by then. I'll be there. My phone can do all the thinking for me. Is anyone optimistic about the influence of technology on future generations? Do tech engineers just not have children? Who are we saving and who are we condemning? Here's a slice of optimism, jazz. I just listened to a couple hours of John Baptiste and his band, and golly gee whiz, that feels like living, breathing angel magic. I'm becoming convinced that music is the only real way to access some other collective consciousness. But how intrusive of history to chime into the conversation about hope and the future, because even music is biased, has an agenda, seeks to persuade. We're siloed in our sounds and safe we play back whatever tells us this is safe for now, things are okay for now, life's not meaningless, we have reasons. Despite my efforts, I arrive at apathy, except when I'm around other people. Then it's just about doing my best to be a good, proper, synaptic sentient exhibiting common decency and a genuine interest in the arrival there of our moments together. Now of our moments together, noticing how your nose feels as the air passes through it. Noticing how your eyes shift, how your body sits or stands or sways, or how your smile comes on or how your tone goes unchanged and how your cadence has tempo and how your skeleton is unbalanced and how your spine is curved your slouch, slave-like, your optimism equally drained. When I think I'm feeling apathetic, I look at basically anyone else and realize I'm actually an optimist. Because I think that I might be able to improve now for them. And even if they agree, it's a wash. I realize that's kind of a downer. Yeah. Um, but since we were talking about music in the last one, here is an attempt at song lyrics. And I'm just gonna read it. Sorry, you don't get to hear me sing. Not today. We need a bigger audience, but okay. It says, a saint on the south side is dying. It says, no use in trying no more. It's like a cold rainfall in winter. Winds whipping, don't listen to them, I implore. It takes one to know one, but when you got no one, it's hard to be blessed, that's for sure. Because time has its folly, fake faces of jolly drip cries like a Hollywood whore. So say a prayer for him to say on the south side, stuck in the pages of noir. Oh, how he goes, and oh, how he stays. Oh, how we make what we do with the time given to us, our gallant displays. A mother is hungry, her children's clothes ugly, hand-me-downs from the thrift store. She scrapes and she squanders and is left to just wander the internet pool on a tour back at her apartment with children around her and an eviction sign hung on the door. So say a prayer for her, the saint on the south side, stuck in the pages of noir. Oh, how she goes. Oh, how she stays. Oh, how we make what we do with the time given to us, our gallant displays. A world wakes up weary with woe like a teary-eyed babe who's been left all alone, neglected by mankind, too torpid to draw the line between our wants and our shows. 
For not money or marriage or midnight pumpkin carriage can carry away a pass from fate. And if we don't change soon, we'll sow our own doom to our children who know it's too late. So say a prayer for them, the saints from the south side, stuck in the pages of noir. Uh, and then this one was uh, a response to uh, all the, you know, BLM and uh, after George, George Floyd, all that happened. Um, I think like most artists with like, you know, uh, a conscious and, and feeling, you know, uh, probably responded in some way. Um, Bloomington had a pretty good march after that, so I took my camera and recorded some of that. Um, and that was like one way to engage because I like to do uh, camera work and photography and videography and all that stuff. Um, but in addition, I wrote a, wrote a poem kind of um, just at, out of like not knowing what to do, you know, kind of feeling beside myself. Um, but it's called The Color of Blood. I will never understand what it's like to be blessed and yet branded from birth by black hands, nor know what it's like to be mistrusted and abused by eyes that see hate through blind, baseless views. The saddest thing seems that to prove what is right comes at the cost of a terrible fight. And so we try and ask, might peace prevail? Those who've tried sadly know that peace remains fleeting and hatred just grows. So fight, they say rather, but what does that get? A whole lot of hurt in our stomachs of pit, tear gas and looting, rubber bullets and mace, cause some remain blind to the one human race. It's always been fear that's kept us apart. Ignorance, cold heartedness, calloused and fraught with greed, who's got and who's not and who's taught that hates the right way on this orbital blue. The hate that stems from, well, I'm not like you, but you are, you, you are. You lost silly fool. What's inside of everyone is inside of you. Color's just pig pigment, a genetic miracle. It's beautiful and complex. Look through a microscope. It's empirical. We come from the same, the ineffable void. It's all classifications and judgment that need destroyed. Not cities or businesses, police stations or cars. We have to look deeper to patch up the scars. The surface is murky, full of insecure woe. But under the surface, we're in the same flow, the same stream of consciousness this moment in time are only now offered by what's called the divine. The what is beyond our best laid attempts to make this a world worth living, a life worth loving, a future worth giving, is we don't figure out how to care for one another. The same hate will fester and form the divide that keeps an equity on the, weighted on the same side. New parents will shiver for their baby's next struggle. How many generations does it take to burst the racist bubble? How long will poor, ba how long will poor families struggle to eat? Stuck, caught in the trap, system trained up their feet. The same inequality will ravage our workplaces, hospitals, prisons. We'll keep on just limping, wounded by divisions. And brand new sad stories will make us cry tears. How has this gone on for so many years? Don't let Floyd's domino be just another lost cause, a drop in the sea. Because if we do, the same murders will lead to the same riots, that lead to the same sadness, that lead to the same divide, that lead to the same, the same, the same must stop. Look to your heart. We all pump the same color blood. Um, and that's all I have for the ones that were printed off, and then I have some other stuff. Too. How am I doing on time, Joan? Oh, great. Nice. Wow, this is, at least I ate up a lot more time. Last time I like ran out of content really quick, so. Um, this one's pretty short. Let's see. Ah, here we go. This is called Capitalism Pie. Given in to the looping consumer cookbook. Dash of indifference, teaspoon of indulgence, two sticks of superficial pomp, Thick, thickly sliced credit cards, thinly sliced income, three whole insecurities, two parts assimilation, a pinch of nationalism, turned over until soft, bake until debt, serve to the Joneses. That is all. That is all.
Uh, well, I guess I'll spend the last little bit of time reading from the Wahoo. So, I self-published a book uh, about uh, one summer aboard a commercial fishing vessel up in Alaska. Um, like the back says, this is a true story of one summer aboard the Wahoo, a commercial fisher vessel whose mission is to brave the bearing and long line for halibut, a flat, ugly fish. The season unfolds through the eyes of a Midwestern boy of 19, who couldn't be greener as he descends into a world of exhaustion, death, self-discovery, and plenty of cigarettes. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What's fun? Usually things from part three are the most fun anyway, so let's start there. All right, so this is from part three, Astral Finale. Octopuses have always seemed mysterious and intelligent. I read somewhere that they would be one of the most evolved species if they taught their offspring a thing or two about life in the great big blue, but they don't pass on knowledge. If they did, our ship would have likely been commandeered by Octosius the Great and his masterful team of sunkship cup mercenaries. Instead, Octosius, Octosius lived alone his whole life, a vagabond of the sea, finding his own way, making it by the grit of his beak and the lure of his snares. One moment to say, also, they have beaks. They literally have beaks, like a bird beak. An octopus has a bird beak. It sounds crazy, but... Do you know that? Octopuses have bird beaks? Oh. <laughs> um... Times were hard for old Octosius, and his meals sparse. He was becoming desperate. His hunger clouded his judgment. That morning, he found a helpless halibut struggling for its life. This seems too good to be true, he thought, and he was right. As I'm looking over the rail, focusing my attention down the line, quickly reeling towards me, I see an orange, unfamiliar figure emerging. Grab your graph gaff for this one, Skipper tells me. Okay, now, when he comes all the way up, you gaff him in the head and pull straight up, motioning as he spoke. Octosius surfaced abruptly, clinging tightly to a lacerated halibut body. I quickly lay my gaff deep into the side of his head. Pulling upward, he detached from the fish and flung aboard. In the moment before his landing, he seemed to look at me, all tentacles evenly spaced away from the center of his body and head erect. His orange color pulsed between vibrant and dull, as if his blood ran cold in the moment he recognized his demise. I empathized with him before his curtain call. How embarrassing, he must have thought. Hey, hurry, get that effort off the deck and hung up. Those slimy guys will slip right through the cracks if you let them, Parisio yelled. I obeyed. Soon there would be curtains of octopus hung all around the deck. I, I tried to edit that for children around. There was a couple bad words in there. So, fun thing to know. So, uh, octopus are so, like, malleable that they can, like, fit through, like, a crack, like, that big. So in order to, like, not let that happen when they fall through the deck, um, you would have to, like, yeah, have them literally hung up in, like, a curtain. Um, let's see. Okay, everybody likes this one. I did this one last time I read here, but I think everybody enjoyed it, so. Um, this one is called A Tale of Passion and Desperation. The year is 1941. The ocean floor quakes from the rumble of industrial death machines that work with man's rationalized, repeated, and reported reason. Below the surface of the Pacific, the nature of competition rears its gills in tandem with the cycle of life circle of life. Alderal Restibule, the newest prince of St. William's Rockfish Clan, wakes this morning to learn of the tyranny of man and life's true challenges. Alderal's father, King Emmanuel, has grown ill and shares his last bit of worldly advice with his newborn son, while the rumbling echoes ripple the atmosphere. They drift. Emmanuel, my son, you must know Although we are capable of living 200 sun cycles, we are not invincible. 
Do not be mistaken by your name, Rock. Like a rock, we must hold true, but unlike diamond, we can break. Beware the predators, swim swiftly, but rest mindfully, and above all, never accept the dangling offering, for it comes from the sky demons and brings with it only death. Aldro. I heard whispers that if the demons take you, your stomach explodes through your mouth. Is it true? Emmanuel. The only thing that must remain true, my son, be the ocean floor. Just remember and heed my words. The year is 2013. The ocean is calm and cool. King Aldero leads his clan north in search of new food sources. The clan has grown desperate, having been driven from their mating grounds by a more powerful southern clan. They have grown low in number. Many are famished beyond city. Only one female remains loyal, the queen. The clan is circled around a fisherman's long line as it is slowly lifted upwards from the ocean floor. Queen. Aldro, I know we promised we would never, but in a time like this, is there really so much difference between gods and demons? Let us accept the offering just this once. No one really... Aldro, how could you even suggest such a thing? I told you what my father said. But if father and I had to watch his clan fall to pieces, slowly dying and abandoning us, I don't care what you say anymore. I will greet the sky demons myself. You are too much a coward anywhere. The queen darts towards the baited hook, bites down tight, and disappears in the distant darkness. No, my queen! King Aldro looks to his clan, who all gape and lightly flutter their fins. In his bright yellow eye, again and again, he sees his beloved, gone, like his father. He remembers, he remembers his queen. For the queen, boys! They all charge for a hook, bite tight, and proceed north towards hell. The ascent seems to increase in speed as they all begin feeling a pain in the side of their cheeks. Alderal has never seen the atmosphere so bright. It nearly blinds him. He begins to feel something happening to his stomach. It is expanding. He begins to panic. He thinks of his queen. She must have felt the same pain. It continues to expand like a long, thin balloon. His throat projects his doom. He breaches the surface, only to see his queen turned inside out, covered in blood. He passes out before slapping the wooden deck. Whoa, man, I gotta ask, what's with the balloon-looking things coming out of these guys' mouths? Oh, you mean the rockfish? Yeah, it's something to do with their stomach chemicals. When they surface too fast, it expands, and it's kind of a shame when we catch real big ones, though, because uh, when they get to be a real good size like that one, I mean, shit, he's probably been around since World War II. There's also language in that that I had to take out. But <laughs> that is all. I think I'm I'm pretty close. So, um, yeah. Here, I'll give you one more poem for the last two minutes. Let's see. There is one in here. I assure you. All right, well, this isn't the one, I, oh, here we go. This isn't the one I was thinking, but I'll read it anyway. So uh, we had to, like, f ice the fish in what's called a fish hold under the, the boat. So this is just, like, talking about that. And the fish hold proved to be a mystical place. Christmas lights lined the square ceiling. Every section was snowy, ready to be filled, ready to fill the gaping bellies of the losers. The rooms void to be stacked. The hold is separated into sections by way of stacked two by twelves, all labeled accordingly. The silly flat beasts fill the entire square room below the table. Their tomb will lie in one of mine. We would crawl and slide and scoop and stuff till each and every section stacked. Halibut, they would be stacked. That is all I will say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the small but devoted audience. You guys are great. Um, I brought cards um, that have a QR code that can take you to the book. So if you want one, I'm going to be set up over here at Poetry on Demand for the next hour. So I'll have a little stack next to me. Um, 
but yeah, thanks for listening. Um, yeah, most of you have you've heard some of that, so. Um, but yeah, it's good to have new audience members, so I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, this is always good. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, this endures despite, you know, there being uh, maybe not as much excitement about it as, as other, other things for people. But I love it. So I love you. Thank you all. You're great.